On this episode of China Unscripted, the U.S. says it wants to defend Taiwan, but its actions paint a different picture. Today, we get an Indian perspective on the coming battle with China. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. Joining us once again is Professor M. D. Nalapa. He's the director of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations at India's Manipal University, as well as vice chair of the Manipal Advanced Research Group. Professor, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a it's a quite an important subject. Now, now, first, before we get into it, uh, I just have to take care of a little a little housekeeping. Uh, in a, in, a, in a podcast a few weeks ago, we were interviewing Cleo Pascal and uh, Matt. Now, now, everyone, look at those those innocent puppy dog eyes. In this episode, oh, stop, in this Chris. episode, uh, a couple weeks ago, Matt, uh, with his very unique sense of humor, made a joke about the CIA pushing regime change in India. Matt, would you? Like to say something about that? I, I feel like a lot of Indian viewers yeah, yeah, commented yeah, see, on that. It's not even a storm in a teacup. Uh, it's in a storm in a thimble, actually, because even Cleo was a bit upset about it. But the fact is, in India, you had a few crazies getting upset, but they get upset about everything. I mean, if they see this podcast, you'll get some crazies getting upset. So honestly, uh, I don't see what the fuss is about over there. It's hard. There was no fuss here. And because I think we are reasonably certain that, God forbid, the CIA is good, trying for regime change as it did in the bad old days of the old Cold War, when we were staunch friends of the USSR, I don't think that they didn't succeed then. They're not going to succeed now. I am quite you know, so no problem at all. For God's sake, Matt. I mean, only thing is that sometimes everybody may not get the joke, and that may include me, because our sense of humor may be a little different. That's all. But otherwise. Don't worry about it. It's no problem. Yeah, well, most people say my sense of humor is, in fact, not that funny. And so th that that's probably what's going on. But for clarity, uh, I the CIA does have a history of attempting regime change. Not a good history. Uh, I'm not proud of that uh, as an American. And I think that uh, any attempt, I agree with you, Professor, that it would not succeed in India, uh, nor ought it be attempted. Uh, but the only thing I really apologize for is having such an awful oh, no, sense of humor. Uh, and yet, I do believe that, that that sense of humor will continue uh, today and on future podcasts. I'm not going to change my behavior. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad we got that out of the way. It actually leads into uh, my, my first question because, you know, CIA pushing regime change, it's, it's a real thing. And this is important whenever we talk about China, because anytime there's a big protest in China or in Hong Kong, the Communist Party always falls back on, oh, it's, it's hostile foreign forces. Uh, so I think it's worth looking at like what it looks like when the CIA is actually doing something. And in India, it was interesting. There was a movie a few years ago called Rocketry uh, that actually talked about that. Uh, Professor Nalapak, can you, can you tell us a little bit about that story, what this sort of thing actually looks like? Well, if, you know, if, to to be to be frank with you, I mean, if some of us believe very clearly that uh, there is a new Cold War on. It's called, we call it Cold War 2.0, and it's between the United States and China as the main protagonists. And the earlier Cold War was between the USSR and the US as the main protagonists. And quite frankly, we have got a bad rap of being an ally of the USSR. We have never conducted a single military exercise during the time when the USSR was there, a single military exercise. Uh, privately, I mean, the prime minister decided that publicly would be counterproductive. Privately, uh, the, the USSR was warned, the leadership of the CPSU Politburo, about uh, Czechoslovakia, about Hungary, and very importantly, about Afghanistan. But the reality is that, you know, uh, the Pakistan very cleverly got on the U.S. side early on, Seattle, Cento, everything. And the U.S. has, a, you know, a very, if I may say so, gentlemanly tradition of not falling in love with more than one individual, I mean, one rival. So clearly, they preferred Pakistan. They flooded Pakistan with arms. They created a lot of problems for us in, on the, in the matter of Kashmir. Now, let me remind you, we have more than 200 million Muslims in India. And in Kashmir, at that point in time, when there was a huge ruckus, the Chinese, 
the Americans, the Europeans, I mean, uh, some of the Gulf countries were all saying that Kashmir doesn't belong to you because it's Muslim majority. Hey, what about the 196 million Muslims in the rest of India? We are not a country of just one religion. And, you know, and supposing the, you had a situation where Kashmir broke away because it was majority Muslim, can you imagine the impact on the Hindu psyche uh, all across India? If they say, my God, if these guys get into majority, they'll want to break away. They still don't feel part of India. Let me end by saying, please remember, Chris and Matt, we were partitioned on the basis of religion. The British partitioned us. One third of our country was cut away to form Pakistan, which was an avowedly Islamic state. 38% of people in Pakistan in 1947 were non-Muslims. Today, less than 1.5% is non-Muslim. In India, we had about 38 or so million Muslims. Now we have 200 million Muslims. And I would like everybody in the West who knows a little bit of mathematics to tell us which is the intolerant country among these two. Well, certainly we can see how uh, you know, outside stronger foreign countries can have a big impact on uh, other countries, uh, the, uh, especially you know in Ukraine. And you recently wrote an interesting article about how the war in Ukraine is making a war for Taiwan more likely. Uh, what, what's your argument there? Well, look, let me quote a chap called Morris Chang, who, as you know, uh, he was the founder of uh, TSMC, the, the largest manufacturer of chips in the world. I think it was on March 16, if I remember. He was having a you know, kind of a Q&A with an American author who had written about the chips, uh, the chips war. If I, I, I forget the name in, uh, at this point. But Morris Chang said, well, look, you know, let's be honest. When you're talking about French shoring, Reshoring, okay, you want uh, industries to move to the U.S. French shoring, please understand you from your actions, you don't consider Taiwan to be your friend. This was said publicly in a public forum by the chief of the founder of TSMC, who, by the way, before saying that, said he fully supports the idea of decoupling from China. And guess who doesn't support the idea of decoupling from China? a gentleman by the name of Joe Biden. I don't know if either of you have heard about him. He said, oh, no, we are not looking at decoupling. We are looking at de-risking. All right. Now you have United States, uh, you know, uh, senior people, whether it's Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, you, you name it, all these gentlemen. And I hope, you know, there are a few ladies as well among them. They ought to be. But the fact is, they talk to the Taiwanese in very honeyed tones. And then they talk to other countries and to each other in a different tone. And in today's world of seepages, of, of leakages, of conversation, I don't know how the Biden administration believes that what it says to the Taiwanese, oh, we are with you, we'll stand with you, we'll do whatever, we'll fight and die with you. And then they talk to other countries. Why are you, you know, uh, we want to de-risk. And yes, Taiwan is a risk. And these same individuals keep calling Taiwan a risky place, frankly, you know, and, you're, and now Joe Biden opens that wound by saying, we're not decoupling, we are de-risking. And guess one of the countries he wants to de-risk from? It's Taiwan. And I'm not, you know, don't take my, my statement for it. I'm a citizen of India. I have nothing to do with US or US politics, although I love that country. It's one of my favorite countries. But the reality is, Biden has openly said, we are not decoupling from, from China. Please note that. We are de-risking. And hey, whom are we de-risking from? From Taiwan. Now, you had, for example, TSMC's largest uh, business rival in the U.S. And I think a few years ago, 2020, if I'm not mistaken, he openly said, oh, my God, it's risky to, to get your chips from Taiwan. Get it from us. It's risky to get from Taiwan. Now, this is the message that's going out. Morris Chang is very correct. Taiwan is not a friend of the United States in terms of United States actions. Now, you, you, know, you can say the sweetest things and you have a whole plane loads of Americans 
John Bolton was the latest. And may I point out, Bolton, the same old script. Ukraine, look at Ukraine. Let me tell you, John Bolton may not have understood that, but there's a small difference between Taiwan and Ukraine. There's a civilizational difference. For one thing, Taiwan does not have a gun culture. The Ukrainians have been fighters. In fact, the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was led by Ukrainians, practically, when the, except for the time it was led by a Georgian, jo Joseph Stalin. And the Ukrainians did a pretty good job because by 92, the, the Soviet Union, which is majority Russian, collapsed. I'm just saying that, uh, frankly, as a joke. But what I want to say, quite frankly, is the Taiwanese, you're psyching them. You're psyching them because they don't want to be like Ukraine. And tell me one sane person anywhere in the world who would like to go the Ukrainian way. Have your cities destroyed. Have your, you know, your people on the front line. Have ammunition blow up all over the place and be dependent on a constant stream. First of all, Taiwanese supply chains are very different from Ukrainian supply chains. Taiwanese manpower is different from Ukrainian manpower. And more importantly, the civilian connect. So there are literally dozens of senior Americans and every one of them brings up the issue of Ukraine. I want to say, you know, Chris and Matt, have you guys changed the name of your country from United States of America to Ukrainian States of America? Because you're obsessed with Ukraine and you're obsessed with Ukraine in a way that you keep pushing on the Taiwanese. And let me tell you, the Taiwanese don't want to be another Ukraine. And now they are beginning to believe the Americans want Taiwan to be another Ukraine. That's not true, but that's what many of them are believing. Well, to push back a bit on that, uh, the Biden administration has carried on selling weapons to Taiwan, though with a two-year delay from agreement to actual delivery. Uh, and there is more training going on between U.S. forces and Taiwanese forces. So it does seem like there is some level of support. I don't think the Biden administration is telegraphing that it would just allow a Chinese invasion to happen. Look, uh, let's, let's be factual here. Let's be real here. How many, how many weapons have been supplied free to Ukraine? At last count, zero. Mm -hmm. How many advanced weapons have been supplied to, you, to, to Taiwan as compared to Ukraine? Now, I mean, a few. The reality is, and let's be honest, I mean, I, you know, I know, we all know, we have our own source of intel and information as to what's going on there. The reality is judging by the need. And let's say, for example, I'm not well. I need a certain amount of medication. And I'm given one-fifth that amount of medication. It's super medication, but it's one-fifth of what I need. I'm not going to get better. I'm not saying the Biden administration is not transferring weapons to Ukraine. Yes, it's delaying. The fact is, it's not transferring enough advanced weapons, it's not transferring some advanced weapon systems, and it's not transferring them enough. In other words, you're giving me medication, which is one-fifth of what I need to get cured. So please, again, let's be real on this. Look at what's happening in Ukraine. You are flooding Ukraine with free weapons. You are flooding Ukraine with weapons, period. Hundreds of billions of dollars. How many... How many billions of dollars have you spent in Taiwan in aid? And is it because China is a much smaller threat than Russia? Is it because the threat to, to Taiwan is less than the threat to Ukraine? The Ukraine situation is the Russians have been consolidating what they have had effectively since 2014 in Taiwan. As, since about, you know, since 2021, since Joe Biden came to power. They have systematically violated Taiwanese airspace, sea space, cyberspace. Look at TikTok. Who's studying TikTok? In India, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi in 2020 banned TikTok. You study TikTok in Taiwan and the insidious way it is working to basically change the minds. Good. They change the minds of the Taiwanese people, you know, and, it, and this is the problem that they're facing. They're facing an invasion of their mind space, their cyberspace, in an adversary that is way, way bigger and more powerful than Russia. And they're getting assistance way, way less 
than what is being provided to Ukraine. So the question is, what makes Ukrainian different from Taiwanese? I'd like to know. Well, so if the perception in India is that uh, the U.S. is not a reliable partner to you, uh, to Taiwan in the face of China, what what hope is there that the United States could be a, a reliable partner with India to counter China? Look, as far as uh, we are concerned, obviously India and Taiwan are quite different. Uh, but of course, the, the the defense of Taiwan is important to defense of all of us as democracies. Certainly to all four members of the quadrilateral security uh, dialogue, definitely. But the, it's an entirely different situation in India. For one thing, we are the one country since the Vietnamese in 1979 who have had casualties, fatalities as a consequence of the PLA. And, and uh, the PLA has also been inflicted fatalities by our soldiers. Our estimate by satellite data was that it was 60 and odd. The Russians jumped up and claimed about 55. The Chinese claimed zero, then two, then four, then six. We stick to our stand of 60. Don't forget, we have our troops have been killed in battle at the hands of Chinese soldiers. I don't know if any other country can be in that position. And we have a huge land border. We have a huge sea border to protect. So our situation, and secondly, we are a nuclear power. I remember the days of the Clinton administration when Bill Clinton, all he was looking at was basically transferring Kashmir to Pakistan and blocking India from missiles and nuclear weapons. Let me tell you, we would have been attacked and badly attacked by China, but for the fact that our nuclear weapons and their platforms can reach any part of China from any part of the Indian Ocean. Thank God we didn't listen to the, to the very forcible methods used by Bill Clinton. And he had an assistant secretary of state, Robin Rafael, who was obnoxiously, you know, against India. And she believed India was a Hindu country, just as a lot of people in the New York Times and Washington Post and CNN also think. We are a, we are a, look, we are a country of 1.42 billion people. 200 million of that are Muslims. About 38 million are Christians. We are not just a Hindu country. And we are a syncretic country with a syncretic culture. And every, you know, if you look at the Western media, genocide, it's always imminent genocide. From the time Narendra Modi came as prime minister in 2014, it's always been genocide is imminent in India. For God's sake, it's 2023. It's nearly 10 years. This imminent genocide has not yet happened. What is the meaning of imminence? From my very limited knowledge of the English language, it means it's going to happen very soon. And are you telling me that any sane person will claim that 200 million people can be just wiped out? Is that even physically possible? Of course not. You had that horrible genocide of the Nazis. And, you know, the, uh, one of, a very brilliant community was wiped out by... By, by, I mean, he's not even a human being, Hitler. But look, we're talking of 200 million people in every street in India, in every village in India. And you have the New York Times, you have the Washington Post, you have CNN, you have people in the Biden White House, you have the State Department officials. Oh my God, India, on the brink of genocide, on the brink of genocide. And again, don't forget what you talk to your European colleagues, what you talk to others, what you talk to yourselves. They... They will talk, talk about it. They will write about it. They'll do their personal things about it. And it comes back. And these, these people in authority are talking about an imminent genocide that has not happened at all in any way since 2014. The riot data show very clearly the riots have come down. There are riots. We have 1.4 billion people. There are crazy things that happen. For example, we had preachers coming here from the United States who called uh, our, you know, the Hindu gods by a name which I'm not going to, you know, use on this channel. They, those preachers called Hindu goddesses uh, that belonging to some kind of activity, which I'm not going to talk on this channel. A few people got very angry at that. Now, if somebody were to come from India and go to some parts of, say, Alabama and Tennessee and talk in the same way, about some, you know, uh, the sacred figures 
of uh, of the Christian faith, I'm not very sure that they would that it would take a long time for gunshots to ring out. So the fact is, please, this is a con conscious effort to uh, try and distance India from the people of the United States, the people of the West, at a time when we both need each other to fight this common enemy, which is China. I think that's uh, that's a great point. Uh, as you mentioned, India is the is the only country that has really fought with China. The United States has not done that. So there is really a lot of things the U.S. should be learning from India about how to deal with this common enemy, as you say, China. Um, but it sounds like there's there's just tremendous challenges blocking any meaningful relationship between the U.S. and India in regards to China because of all these other issues. The Department of Defense in the United States is getting on much better with India than, if I may say so, the State Department and the White House. I think Lloyd Austin is a military guy. He, he understands the situation very well. And it's definitely not enough. The, uh, in India also, like in Taiwan, we are asked to pay top dollar for every single bullet, for every single piece of paper or pencil that we buy from Washington. And at the same time, we in Asia are watching a country get flooded with weapons free of cost. Every day, Biden, Mrs. Biden, uh, somebody in the Biden White House, some other leading politicians, oh my God, you have to give more to, to Ukraine, hundreds of billions of dollars more. For God's sake, nobody talks about giving hundreds of thousands of dollars to a country that is actually on the front line with China. Why? Because you have gone back to a trap of being obsessed with a dead Cold War. Cold War with Russia. And as a consequence, Russia and China, China has now made Russia a subsidiary power for the time being. And this is the great effect of this situation. Now, Ukraine. I mean, I've talked to my Western friends. If you check my writing from day one, I was very clear the Ukrainians would be smart. I thought Zelensky would be smart enough to say, look, about one fifth of our country is now occupied by Russia. Uh, de facto, through its proxies. For God's sake, you know, we're not going to be able to fight and get that back in a hurry. Maybe someday the Russian Federation will collapse and then we'll try. But, you know, to, to I never expected them to really believe that they have a military chance of getting it back. And, I mean, and unfortunately, Putin also believed that they want to try and get it back with the help of the West. I don't know if that's what people in the West were planning. I mean, I don't know, you know, frankly, if anybody would be, have been planning that. But unfortunately, a chap called Vladimir Putin believed that and thought he better move into, into the occupied parts of Ukraine before the Ukrainian army moves in. And he did so. Well, that's fine. But the fact is, fine means, from the point of view, all that has happened. It's an aggression. It's an invasion. It's a war. It should not have happened. But the reality is, you have taken your eye completely off the ball. It's almost as though Joe Biden was waiting for a trigger to go back to the Cold War he was so comfortable with. The Cold War that he has really lived his life in as being a senator. As, you know, and Obama tried a little bit of a refit. It didn't work out. And Biden was, I mean, frankly, he has gone back to this default option of Russia. And today, what are you seeing? You're seeing a procession of VIPs land up in China essentially begging China to ensure that the Russians stop in Ukraine when the Chinese are the biggest gainers from this. And what happens in the Western world? You have a lot of lawyers. They like the written word. You have a lot of politicians. They love the spoken word. So what happens? The Chinese tossed little tidbits in the way of the West. One recent tidbit was one UNGA resolution. Tremendous excitement in Europe and America. Actually talking about Russian aggression in the in the some kind of a preamble to a resolution that is supported by the way by india also by and by china now that's i mean for god's sake a unj resolution means nothing a preamble means even less so that little tidbit is enough for the very large group of pro china people in the united states including in your social media platforms let me add including in your media including in in different political parties and in positions of power to jump on this and say, look, Xi Jinping is with us. He's actually said Russia is committing aggression. Why? By being one of some hundred and odd countries 
that have signed on to a declaration by the UNGA, which frankly, in terms of practical effect, is not the, worth the paper it's published on. So you can, let's be honest, in Asia, in we are dismayed by the shift of focus of effective US uh, the, you know, support back to Europe and away from Asia. And very importantly, the US believing that the Taiwanese are essentially a people who are you know, fairly simple-minded people. They're not very advanced. So you have a large number of visitors going there. Everybody who goes there does a lot of chest thumping. You have Nancy Pelosi. And now you have, of course, the speaker, fortunately, met him in California. Look, Taiwan is not helped one bit by any of these visits and the brave words that are uttered there, mostly for political theater back home. They want practical stuff. They want advanced weaponry. They want a clear outline of sanctions. They've already been ag aggressed. What are the sanctions? Who are the Chinese generals and Chinese policymakers, CCP, who have been sanctioned? Can you name... Uh, you know, a soldier in the PLA who's been sanctioned? Of course not. It's uh, definitely not. You can't because there isn't any. So they're looking at hard reality and the Americans are thinking like they thought in so many countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, honeyed words are what we need. So a lot of honeyed language. We have also got that honeyed language, but in our private conversations we've made it very clear. Honey is fine, but honey doesn't win a war. And all I can say so far, the Biden administration is concerned. Trump was concerned. He's about the, Biden is about the same as Trump. We are getting about one third the paid for help that we need to fight China. I must confess, we're getting about 70% of the intelligence that we are getting to fight China. During Trump's time, we got 90%. Now it's about 70%. We are getting overall assistance of that kind, which is all that we want. We don't want your soldiers. We want your advanced weaponry. We're not getting it. We are a poor country. We can't afford to buy it in the quantities needed to secure our border. We can't afford it. And the Taiwanese, frankly, can afford it. But they are griping about the fact that you're saying that Taiwan is a front line of democracy. And what are you doing? You're not even, you know, you, you, you're getting top dollar out of the front line of democracy. You want some, you know, security of the U.S. is linked to Taiwan and you make them pay for it. And you don't give them advanced weaponry. And frankly, a lot of intel as well. You're sharing intel, but not enough. I think if Trump had been, I don't like uh, Donald Trump, frankly. I was happy that he was defeated. I'm glad, I was glad initially that Biden came, but I am told the intel reaching Taiwan today is nowhere what it was beginning to under Donald Trump. It was accelerating under Donald Trump. It's now decelerating under a White House that seems to believe that China holds the key to the future of the United States and, of course, the Ukraine conflict. That's what we think in Asia. And may I say that this Ukraine conflict and the complete attention, the complete you know, flow of non-paid-for resources, the complete domination of the media by a country which, frankly, was, under, was part of the Soviet Union for a long time, and that from 2014 onwards, those parts that Russia is claiming have been under have been under Russian control, effective Russian control. I don't think the West has been critically wounded in that. And then you hear Biden and you hear Rishi Sunak, before him Johnson, you hear Ursula von der Leyen, you see the you know Scholz. Oh my God, Ukraine is the center of Western civilization. If Ukraine falls, Europe falls apart. Western civilization falls apart. Then where were you from 2014 to, to you know, to 2022 uh, when 14, when that part of Ukraine was cut away in effect? I mean, this nonsense about Ukraine being central to Western security is meaningless unless you're talking of a land invasion of Russia. But I don't believe anybody in NATO or the West will be talking about. So I want to say you're wrong about that. We have had more military drills with the United States than with all other countries combined, in my reckoning. And there's a small little research group that I'm there. Uh, more military drills in the United States, more, if I may say so, joint activity on mountain warfare, naval operations and all that. But a lot of that is DOD focused. And the DOD is, I think, awake 
to the need for India. But the DOD also seems to be on the same page. There's no real Cold War 2.0. It's still Cold War 1.0. It's still Russia. That's the big bad wolf at the door. Frankly, the Russians are nothing compared to the, the, the dragon that's now at the door. Well, let me ask you a question about Ukraine, because it seems that one argument for the U.S. and, and NATO defending Ukraine against a Russian invasion is that if the West lets Ukraine fall to an authoritarian power, then A, what message does that send about the West's willingness to defend Taiwan? Uh, and B, just with Russia by itself, what message does it send that, oh, well, you can go ahead and, you know, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk. So now Russia is going to say, oh, well, maybe I want to take you know, part of uh, Czech Republic or part of whatever other territories it decides one day it wants. And it's the same fear that I have with the Chinese Communist Party that it'll take Taiwan and then it'll say, oh, well, maybe I want to take uh, parts of Japan. I want to take uh, parts of Vietnam or, or Indonesia, et cetera. And so, uh, again, with Ukraine, doesn't it still make political sense to defend Ukraine against authoritarian invasion? Look, first of all, from 2014 onwards, the land that uh, is now under contestation has been effectively under Russian control. Effectively. Of course, you had Victoria Newland and others. And by the way, Newland came to India and uh, she came back to Washington. And soon after that, it just it took 900 days for an Indian citizen to get a visa when it took three days for a, it takes three days for a Chinese citizen to get a visa. I wrote a column in Sunday Guardian based on my contacts in Washington, that said Newland was pushing for an effective denial of visa to Indians by raising the, you know, the 900 days for a visa to the people of the largest democracy in the world. We have 5 million Indian Americans. If anybody was sick, if anybody had a marriage, you simply couldn't go to the U.S. Even today, it's hell to get a U.S. visa. And what are we talking And the Chinese, they walk in and get a visa. So let's be, let's be you know, clear about this. The fact is, I don't believe as somebody who has studied a little bit of geopolitics, who has dealt a little bit with military activities, and who, that Ukraine is so central to the defense of the Western world, including Poland and the other countries there. I don't believe it, frankly, but Taiwan is. Taiwan is central to the defense of the Indo-Pacific which is today the central theater of operations. I'm sorry. I know that, you know, uh, the, I mean, I know that there are a huge number of Americans who basically believe America was a slice of land that somehow strayed to the other side of the Atlantic, but it's essentially Europe. But frankly, it's no longer Europe. It's Asia. It's no longer the Atlantic. It's, uh, it's the Indo-Pacific. It's no longer Ukraine. It's Taiwan, tech, et cetera, et cetera. On various things, the first island chain, I can repeat, and you know the answers very well. And it's no longer Russia, it's China. Look, as I said from, I think, about the first weeks of this particular war, and I had a lot of trolling and abuse from even from friends in the West. After about seven, eight months, I think that trolling became has become almost zero. And now a larger number, a larger number of them are now agreeing with my point of view. I mean, the the reality of the situation is quite frankly, that there is a clear double standard here. Taiwan, the, give me the total of weapons you're supplying Taiwan, the type of weapons you're supplying Taiwan, the type of weapons and on what financial terms you're supplying Taiwan, with that you're supplying to Ukraine. And tell me if Taiwan has not been aggressed into. Xi Jinping wants only one thing. He wants to be certain that the West and the Quad will not intervene militarily if he attacks Taiwan. If he has, if his intelligence people give him that feeling, he is definitely going to try and take over Taiwan because that is the crowning glory of his state. That is the basically the justification he used inside the party to get this third term, fourth term, to be president for life, that I am going to get Taiwan. And he said that publicly, He's, you know, and party journals have been saying that, Within this term of, uh, of the general secretary, Taiwan is going to be you know, taken over again. 
by 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 china again it never still never taken over but please understand and now what happens you have the boltons and everybody going there and saying well don't worry we'll supply arms to you fine how are you going to supply arms from where from japan from south korea for uh, through ship in that uh, you know in the in the in the in the indo, indo pacific it's much more difficult to supply arms to taiwan and if you're doing that do it now do it openly so that you can deter china today if morris chang who admitted that tsmc has to decouple from the united from china and who has invested massively in the united states he is saying to a taiwanese audience don't mistake the united states when you talk of friend shoring taiwan is not in the list of us friends and what do we see we see the south korean president coming lionized by the white house we see the philippines lionized and what do we see in taiwan nobody of consequence till now blinken hasn't gone there sullivan hasn't gone there nobody has gone there of you know except politicians going there to make a political point back home please understand one thing we are we are we are i mean i was born in a village many of us are born in villages but we are not our minds are not entirely simple minded and we are not entirely bad in mathematics and in logic and reason so that's otherwise you wouldn't be having so many indian ceos there which is why you have created this controversy over segments of hindu society to try and kneecap you know indian uh, ceos uh, uh, in various ways the fact is looked at it from asia the reality is joe biden is a europeanist in other words he believes america is fundamentally a european country i have said for the last 32 years if you check back on google that the americans are a quadri continental country they're asian they're european they're south american they're african and you're losing these three continents because of the belief you're embedded in this fantasy that europe is all that counts and again i repeat mathematically show me what you've done for ukraine over just the last 14 months and show me what you've done for taiwan over 14 years and i'll tell you why my argument is right so just so i make sure i understand what you're saying um you know the us will say oh we have to defend ukraine because if that falls china will think taiwan will fall but if the us really cared about taiwan it would be putting sanctions on china for constantly harassing its air defense identification zone it would be giving taiwan lots more weapons not just selling and delaying uh some weapons from time to time it would be the us would be making it easier for indians to be able to come to america rather than streamlining the process for china so what you're saying is that when you actually match up words to actual action it doesn't sync up look yo we are talk biden is openly talking of de-risking when his officials are talking about the risk in the taiwan straits now why don't you invest uh, why why don't you invest heavily in taiwan you are asking taiwanese companies to come to the united states why don't why don't american companies go to taiwan the how many hundreds of millions of billions of dollars are invested in communist china and you, why you invest there what are the arms that are supplying taiwan may i tell you again my point is very simple chris my point is you are giving medication at at cost plus markup to taiwan and to india and to um, more on to other you know asian countries which is not what as uh, which is nowhere near what is needed to confront this dragon india fortunately we have our own uh, you know advantage in terms of troops in terms of mountain warfare and most importantly a deterrence capability in terms of nuclear weapons so the chinese are never going to be very adventurous with india but they can be with taiwan uh, the, as far as japan is concerned they are a screwdriver away from the atom bomb and if uh, frankly the south koreans i would be very surprised if there aren't some very smart south korean scientists who are now making the south koreans a screwdriver away from the bomb the fact is look at actions and look at the american treatment of a country that has systematically sought to kneecap the united states please go and read what i've been writing in 2020 for example openly and saying openly that internet platforms are going are are, are being weaponized 
by the Chinese to ensure that societal fault lines in India and the United States widen. Yes, in India, fortunately, we, you know, we have banned TikTok, we have banned a lot of Chinese apps. We have moved in a way that you guys haven't moved for some, for some odd reason. But the fact is, the reality is, they're, they're delighted by what's happening in the United States. They're delighted by all this rift, societal rift, which is now being created in the United States by this kind of me, you, too, you know, enemy dialogue. They're delighted by it. And may I point out, the only gainer from the Ukraine conflict, Russia-Ukraine conflict, is China. The more the attention of the Western world gets drained away from Asia into Europe, into Ukraine, the better. I suspect there's a point in which if this war lasts that point, they will feel it's safe to invade Taiwan. So please understand one thing. You are saying very clearly about you know, what you're doing in Ukraine. What you're doing in Ukraine is making Xi Jinping very, very happy. So there is a meeting coming up of the Quad, and it certainly sounds like there is a big rift between India and the U.S. But what about India's relationship with uh, the other members of Quad, uh, Australia and particularly Japan? Look, I don't believe there's a rift between the U.S. If you define the United U.S. as, frankly, uh, you know, may not be the top rungs, but the other rungs of the national security ladder, they are very focused on the China threat. As far as the U.S. media is concerned, we have, you know, your platform, for example, is very focused on the China threat. Uh, I mean, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post would never listen to this point of view, frankly. They are a free press, a free media, so long as you act like Pravda and People's Daily and tell what you want to say. You look at the Western press on Ukraine. You look at the Western press, it's completely, absolutely, monotonously the same. And that's a free press. They are, I mean, the other guys are just shut down. So the reality is, frankly, that the Chinese, it's a gift of God given to China, this Ukraine conflict. And as far as Putin is concerned, I believe, and like I said, I think India has had very good connects with Russia. And please look at my writings. I have argued for many years now, don't buy Russian armaments. That includes the S-400 missile. I wrote that when Donald Trump was the president. I, senior officials told me, great. We are not going to buy S-400. You say you buy American, we are buy THAAD. Do you know what they're saying to us? They're not promising us THAAD. And, if they, and THAAD, if, they, if we do get it, it will be entirely manned by Americans. The data will only go to Americans. We won't even be joint managers of that. And very importantly, we'll have to pay through our noses for that system. Um, uh, about 60% more than we'll be paying the Russians. So where is the option? Of course, the second point they made, which again, frankly, uh, at that point in time, I did not take seriously, was that there will not be sanctions on India because already the American, you know, the, those who are studying China, they know without India, you cannot overcome China. And we know that without the United States active involvement, we cannot once and for all take care of the CCP threat. We can hold it at bay. We can reverse it. After 2020, they, were, they have been reversed every time they tried to come. Uh, Doklam now, they're doing stealth diplomacy with Bhutan and they're trying to ensure by very persuasive means, muscle or others, that Bhutan cedes territory to them, which is very important from the defense of India. Now, if that happens, we may have to move. And if we move and immediately State Department, oh my God, oh my God, you know, you're doing something. Well, for God's sake, it's our defense. It's our territory. And let me again add, we want your intelligence. We want your help navally along with us in the Indo-Pacific. We don't want a single American soldier. We don't need American soldiers. We have roughly 36 million young people who are trained in bearing arms. And now we have an Agni you know, scheme, an Agni Veer scheme, which is going to ensure that we'll have in the next decade, about 70 million young people trained to bear arms and fight in land, sea, and air. So may I say, we don't want your soldiers at all. Frankly, I had argued in 2003 that we should send troops to Kurdistan as Bush wanted it. 
Unfortunately, my argument was overruled by the then Prime Minister, Mr. Vajpayee. He said, no, no, no. How can this be happening? But so I've been a long time advocate of India and the United States working together. But I don't want troops in India at all. For one thing, they're horribly expensive. One thing, they're undertrained from the point of view of thing. Because let me tell you frankly, there's no substitute for being on the front line of a live bullet. No military exercise, no computer simulation can prepare you for that. And that's why when the Chinese mistakenly thought they could cheat us by, you know, getting those clubs with nails, etc., and jumping at our soldiers who had no bullets uh, with them, no guns with them, they thought they could do an easy walkover and they found that they could not. Why? Because our soldiers face death every day at the hands of China at the hands of the Islamists. I won't call it Pakistan, it's no longer a country. At the hands of the Sino-Wahhabi alliance. We face death every day in our soldiery. And of course, we are grateful to them. We have been trained and schooled in that warfare. And the American soldiers, frankly, now, they did face death. And the, the standard operating procedure was save American lives. I mean, if you study the SOP, you have a whole lot of uh, Iraqi, Syrian, Libyan, Afghan lives have been lost, but save American lives at all costs. And we saw in Asia, forgive us for being not so smart, for not understanding the genius behind Biden's, you know, uh, August 15th, 2021 withdrawal from Afghanistan, surrendering everything, Bagram Air Base, everything, surrendering 40, 45 billion dollars worth of weaponry to the Taliban. Forgive us for not understanding that little stroke of genius designed to fight China. Okay, Biden says publicly it's to concentrate on China. And then what does he do? He jumps onto Ukraine and Russia, forgets all about China. So please tell me, you know, we read newspapers. We check what's happening. We have access to data, a lot of data. We are pretty good at that. And I mean, the messages that we are getting are the messages any normal, rational mind would get and come to the conclusions we are coming, which is frankly, are we going to get that massive flow of weapons? There's no point in giving us the weapons when the attack already starts. And may I point out, when the Galwan attack came, we got more Russian weapons during that period and more Russian flights of weapons than American flights and American weapons. Please understand that. During the time when our army was confronting the Chinese army, and both armies were losing life. The Russians were giving us weapons more, of course, at high cost, like the Americans at high cost, much more than the Americans. So tell me, I'm logical, I'm rational. Now, the point is, you, if you want to build an antidote, deterrence, you have to ensure that the antidote is supplied in sufficient quantities. On a personal note, my wife and I both got COVID in 2021. And fortunately for us, we had the, the Trump cocktail. And both of us took the Trump cocktail. We were pretty, in fact, my wife was not really, you know, 103 temperature. I was about 101. Uh, she was not looking very good. We immediately went to the hospital. And fortunately, the Trump cocktail is available in that hospital. We both took it. In a matter of one night, we were normal. Thank God for, I mean, for, for pharmaceutical science. And I'm sure there have been more than a few Indians and other Asians who involved in that research, Indian Americans, of course. But the fact is, we want that kind of thing. But you have to give weapons to us. You have to give a reassurance to us. And your reassurance has to be public. Asian populations are important in democracies like Taiwan. The Taiwanese are saying, what do these Americans and Europeans want? They want us to die like the Ukrainians. They want our country to be cut apart like the Ukrainians. It's not a very attractive prospect to a people who really have a, no gun culture and no real training in warfare. Let's be honest. That's not their history. That's not their civilization. That's why Chiang Kai-shek rolled over them so easily in a matter of five or six days. That's what happened. So please, please, you know, gentlemen, give me facts. Give me reality. Because unfortunately, in Asia, sweet words and fantasies are lovely for nursery rhymes. But I think certainly in my case, I'm a bit too old now to really like a nursery rhyme. Well, I think another place where you do sort of see this U.S. attitude um, is in the Pacific, the Pacific Island nations. Um, the U.S. has definitely dropped the ball there 
And I know President Modi is headed to Papua New Guinea soon to meet with the government there and host a meeting between India and other leaders of the Pacific Island nations. Why do you think that meeting is happening? What, what role would India like to play in the Pacific? Look, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, given the fact that Joe Biden is considered in Asia as essentially a European on the wrong side of the Atlantic Ocean, let, let's be honest and let's be real. Let's talk frankly. You know, what I like about, about, uh, about being in America, once people understand me and understand where I'm coming from, which is a strong proponent of a strong democratic alliance between the United States and India, well, they can take uh, hard facts as mentioned, as given by me. They gave me hard facts on Ukraine. I gave them hard facts back. And now most of them are now agreeing with my hard facts and discarding theirs. But the fact of the matter is, our relationship with them is entirely different from the relationship of Australia, New Zealand, and US on them. Australia and New Zealand particularly, they have gone there as members of a superior civilization, as members of a superior economy, as members of, you know, essentially a better class of people. Now, I don't believe in caste at all. I think any notion of inferiority and superiority is absurd. I believe we are all equal. That if you look at this pen, it's horizontal. That means we are all different but equal. It's not vertical. Somebody high, somebody low, somebody in the middle. So the fact is our chemistry is different. And you have people in the United States, in your think tanks, in your politicians, in European think tanks, in the politicians. They've gone so wrong in forecasting what's going to happen in Ukraine. I know their forecast because they told me that. And they, they said that publicly. And now these same guys, quite frankly, you know, it's, it's not enough to know Chinese. It's not enough to visit China dozens of times. I have, by the way, visited China dozens of times. It's a different matter. But, you know, but the fact is that you have to understand the chemistry. Let's be honest. This is Asia. Chemistry counts for a lot more than mechanics. Mechanics is learning a language. Mechanics is learning by rote the history over the last thousand or two thousand years down to the last set to each century. But chemistry is a connect with people. And there are Americans, there are Europeans who have that connect, quite frank. In my own case, I'd like to say, my geopolitical theories have gone mainstream outside my country, even in the West, because I've had Western people. I've had Western people who liked what I had to say, and they have given me massive assistance. In fact, I'd like to thank, you know, some of them have appeared on your platform. At least one of them I know has appeared on your platform. I'm very happy about that because they know I'm a friend of the West. But the problem with the United States has always been, you can't, you know, if you want to show, you show that you're a friend of the United States. Wear it in, in a placard around your neck. I love Uncle Sam. For God's sake, the minute you do that, you're degrading yourself back home and you're ceasing to have any value as a friend. Be a friend indeed, not a friend in need. As far as, you know, words are concerned, we are getting three, four times the good words that we're getting. But the good thing about Biden, he didn't fall into that trap, you know, set by some of these regime change, Victoria Nuland kind of people and have sanctions on India for buying Russian oil and the S-400. Today, we are the huge buyers of Russian oil. There's no sanctions from the United States, quite frankly. And that is a great boon to us. And that, I think, shows that Biden has got people in his White House, in his establishment, who do not really act as though America is a, is a, is a part of Europe or that it's only Europe that matters. That was the case, yes, 120, 130 years ago. It's not the case now. So let me be frank. There is a lot of good happening, but it's about 30 percent of what is needed if you're really looking at a war with China. And I believe that war is inevitable. I think your platform shares that view. I have that different view this, uh, you know, uh, from people in the West who say, no, 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 they got too much to lose, too much to risk. Well, so did Prussia, so did Germany. And they went into war because they had the wrong, some illusions. Today, I can tell you, many Taiwanese do not believe the Americans will seriously jeopardize their relationship with China. They believe there'll be some nominal sanctions or something, a little bit here and there. But in terms of assistance, no. And I again repeat, you're giving them one-fifth the medication needed to come back to fighting fit form. 
वन फिफ्थ द मेडिकेशन थ्री फिफ्थ द मेडिकेशन नाइन टेंथ द मेडिकेशन इज नॉट इनफ यू आर गिविंग यूक्रेन टू हंड्रेड परसेंट द मेडिकेशन दे नीड एंड यू आर गिविंग टाइवान वन फिफ्थ यू आर गिविंग इंडिया अबाउट अगेन अबाउट अ फिफ्थ सो आई एम नॉट सेंग यू डूइंग नथिंग यू नॉट डूइंग इनफ बिकॉज यू आर अज्यूमिंग इन योर माइंड ओनली यूरोप काउंट्स एंड द चाइनीज कैन बी डेल्थ विद दे कैन बी you know they can be taught not to create a problem and every now and then they throw this tidbit some meeting with a foreign minister some smile from xi jinping some unga resolution ah look 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 the chinese aren't going to fight they will fight when they are convinced nato will not fight they will fight when they are convinced japan will not get involved in logistics they will fight when they are convinced india will not activate its northern border they will fight and they are working hard to achieve these objectives they are not succeeding very well in india our prime minister is pretty clear sighted i suspect they are succeeding a lot more in the uk for example do you know that the united kingdom your good friend you have orcus you didn't invite us into orcus we don't need it because we have got nuclear submarines but you didn't invite us that's a different matter we are not there we are not invited to your party but the fact of the matter is that the uk no longer talks of the indo pacific you look at james cleverly Look at all the Foreign Office statements. It's all Pacific, Pacific, Pacific. Why? To pacify China. And James Cleverly has said openly, we want to reach out to China. And one of the ways of reaching out, the Chinese hate the word Indo-Pacific. They're allergic to the word India because we are the only country that has the size to seriously challenge them and upset their apple cart in Asia. we could do it much easier if the united states were on the same page but we can still do it but much more with a lot more effort but that's why they hate us that's why they hate the word indo pacific and guess who dropped the word indo pacific the british those great friends of the united states that the members of nato orcus uh, partners they are the ones who have today dropped officially any mention of indo pacific for fear that xi jinping's tender sensibilities will be offended if that happens well we know how sensitive xi jinping is he doesn't even like to be compared to winnie the pooh which is so, so it's surprising that honeyed words don't work on xi jinping actually look let's be honest the chinese are openly under xi jinping what they have been for a long time which is they are looking at real issues and since narendra modi came to power in india india has also started looking at real issues which is why frankly india post 2014 is a problem for china we are very clear sighted about the chinese xi jinping one thing about the communist the ccp xi jinping has made it transparent we want to take over from the united states we want to we have mastered the eurasian landmass with the help now of our i mean i don't know what we call a captive partner uh, the russians captive by frankly uh, a lot has to do with western diplomacy but you know he is and he's very he has already taken over the the south china sea he wants to take over the malacca straits he wants now to move into the east china sea he's doing that very well by slices of salami that are large or small and above all each time salami is tossed some symbolic gesture is passed on to the west and today you guys have become what we were in the 50s 60s even the 70s don't forget in 72 we signed an agreement in shimla in which we gave back 93000 pakistani pows without any of them being cashiered for war crimes with and we gave back territory that we took without any uh, you know any uh, substantiation of kashmir being ours so that we used to believe in honeyed words from pakistan from the west today i can tell you we don't and i can assure you xi jinping does not believe in those words and for him he wants a situation where it is safe for him to to re- to make sure that if he attacks philippines or vietnam or india the us will can do very little and will do very little and in the meantime the us does not train with india does not look into vietnam does not look into philippines does not look into japan in other words he wants the united states to be removed from the equation completely and that's why he's reacting to and on the excuse of he can't say that openly because china is a peace loving country the ccp is the most peace loving party in the whole world i mean they have never you know oppressed anybody you just ask the people in xinjiang 
and you'll see how free of oppression they are. But the reality is, let's be blunt, let's be real again. The reality is, today is the Western world that is being deluded by fantasies, that's being deluded by honeyed language. And I think, frankly, it's a very dangerous situation. We were in extreme danger because of that fantasy, believing in fantasies, believing in nursery rhymes. Now you guys are in that thing. And one of the nursery rhymes is, Ukraine matters more than Taiwan. Europe matters more than Asia. These, Russia matters more than China. These are fantasies. Well, speaking of the difference between honeyed words versus actions, um, recently we helped uh, the former premier of uh, Solomon Islands, Malaita province, Anu Sudani, come to the Washington, D.C. to try and warn the U.S. government about what's happening uh, with China. And the U.S. State Department initially rejected his visa. He couldn't come to the U.S. It was only because of two uh, bipartisan congressional letters that the State Department, Biden State Department, finally caved and actually allowed him to come. Uh, so we helped fund that trip. But I also want the audience to know that when Daniel Sudani had serious medical issues and the corrupt Solomon Island Prime Minister Sogavari tried, blocked him from getting that medical treatment, it was you who helped reach out to Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen to get Sudani to Taiwan to get that medical treatment. And I think that's a very clear example of, you know, actions versus words. The U.S. didn't help with that. Well, uh, I'd like to say Australia, for example. You know, uh, I'm very certain that when Daniel Sudani goes back, uh, the, he'll land in Australia. He'll be treated like, not even like a tourist, like an unwanted visitor, as he was treated on all his stays in, Aust in Australia, even when he was Premier of Malaita. And the New Zealand, the same. I don't even think he'll be allowed to come to New Zealand. And you're talking of a United West? A united West fighting a war many thousands of miles from Asia against a country that, in our view, is not relevant to the future of the Eurasian continent as much as some of the countries in Asia are. So, frankly, yes, I'm, I, I, I mean, you know, but I mean, so far as President Tsai is concerned, this is what I want to say. The biggest assistance that is being given to the KMT is being given by Joe Biden because you are seeing only uh, basically. A lot of optics and no real action. And when even Morris Chang says this, then you know people are asking President Tsai because President Tsai has stuck her neck out, not just for Daniel Sudani. She's a very, you know, a very courageous person, I'd like to say. And not that I know her very well or anything. We have met a few times officially, as I met I mean leaders in other parts of the world. But the fact is, she has acknowledged that Taiwan is an ally of the United States. And you have got this little uh, lollipop, a major non-NATO ally of the United States. Well, Pakistan is also a major non-NATO ally of the United States. And we all know what that ally is doing. But what are you doing to help this major non-NATO ally? What weapons are you giving to Taiwan? In what quantity? Under what terms? What kind of intelligence are you providing to Taiwan? What kinds of training are you giving to Taiwan? And most importantly, why doesn't the Secretary of State visit Taiwan? Why doesn't the Secretary of Defense visit Taiwan? Why are they so scared of Xi Jinping? I mean, I don't understand it. We are there on the front line. Our soldiers are there. You have about 300,000 Chinese soldiers. You have an equal number of Indian soldiers. We are there on the front line. We are going eyeball to eyeball in the seas, in the skies, in cyberspace, in ways that I mean, I'm not particularly keen on discussing here, but you guys are not. You're far away. And you have, I mean, the, you know, the Chinese will be bankrupt without the goods that you're buying. Incidentally, we also have that little thing that we are contributing more than 100 billion to the Chinese kitty. You guys contribute much more. You don't even have the guts, the spine to go there. And how are you going to show that President Tsai was right in putting all her cards on the Western deck? The argument that KMT is doing, this lady has put all her cards on a shaky deck that is clearly not going to help us. That's the one argument they're using day after day after day. And the Chinese are licking their chops at the prospect of Terry Go or Foxconn coming as the chairman of Taiwan. Because believe me, they will make sure through Foxconn assets in China that they can get Mr. Go to do exactly what they want which is take over the island by stealth 
and undo eight years of delinking from China and coupling with the, with the United States in particular, in defense, in intelligence, in every which way that President Tsai has been doing. So, I mean, you know, uh, the KMT should actually, you know, thank you. They should actually thank President Biden for what he's doing because he is the best argument for a Taiwanese citizen who doesn't want to become another Ukrainian and doesn't want Taiwan to be a Ukrainian to vote KMT and to vote against a Taiwanese president who has put all her cards on the American table. She hasn't got a single card anywhere else. So later this year, India is going to be hosting the G20. Um, what do you think India is going to bring to the table? Because it's, it seems like there is this binary option that's being faced with the world of either the West or China. But it seems like there's there's really a, a, a vacuum that could be filled by Indian coalition with coalition with other Pacific Island nations, with Taiwan. What is there a third option? What is India going to bring to the table at G20? Look, as far as Taiwan is concerned, I think uh, a whole lot of uh, relationships are there with Taiwan. I think in various fields they are they are there, and I have been very active for about twenty years in promoting tech cooperation between India and Taiwan. I would like to see Manipal, my university, become a tech hub, the way Stanford is, for example. You know, uh, and I think if a Taiwanese tech company were to invest there, uh, they'd find a huge amount of talent. But uh, coming to the other issues, don't forget the last two G20 meetings, an agreed statement was torpedoed by Russia and China. Every other member of the G20, including Brazil and South Africa, which, by the way, the Chinese are trying desperately to woo both these countries. Brazil and South Africa stood with India and we stood with the United States and with the European countries, China and Russia with outliers in a very mild resolution, very, very mild resolution. It passed muster at Bali, but the same resolution was torpedoed by China and Russia. And this time also, we are not going to basically change our strategic positioning for the sake of getting a, a so-called unanimous resolution at the cost of our national interest and the cost of our strategic interest. And we, at this time also, I believe it might happen if there is some common sense prevailing in China and the Chinese want at least one Indian in every thousand to believe that they can be friendly to us. As, as of now, hardly anyone believes that. Well, then they will not uh, sabotage us. And the Russians, frankly, as I said, all of us are friends in Russia. We have a long history of very good relations with Russia. That has continued till, as I said, in the Galwan clash, the Russians sent us more arms than the Americans did. That's a statement, let me tell you. And they are very clear. They were pressured by China into going along with China on this statement. It is only the Chinese. And in the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which also Narendra Modi is now president, Pakistan and China are working together to sabotage India, along with, you know, with, with, I mean, in NATO, for example, Turkey. Turkey is acting in a way to sabotage. What is the West doing about any of these countries? Nothing. Nothing at all. You're so obsessed with saving Western civilization by that epitome of Western civilization, which is Ukraine. That epitome of democracy, of freedom, of honesty, of good, whatever you call it, which is Ukraine. And that horrible monster, you know, which is menacing the whole world and for which we need China's help, Russia. So for God, again, G20, yes, India is the chair, is the chairman of G20 for 2023. Yes, we will invite every country in the G20 without any, you know, exception. Absolutely. I mean, if the West wants to keep away from G20, the West will be harming itself in the eyes of Indian public opinion very significantly. But I don't think the West is going to be even Joe Biden and Blinken and the other Europeanists or well, the European powers, for example. The, the tone has changed very much over the last five or six months. Very, very much. And Biden has shown his ability to understand the Indo-Pacific by the fact that there have been no sanctions on India on S-400 and on buying Russian oil. I'd like to say. So as far as our Western partners are concerned, they will come. South Africa will come. I know Brazil, Chinese have been saying, why do you go to this stupid country? They've been talking to the South Africans informally. Why do you want to go to India? Why you've got so many Indians here? What a mess they're creating. Why do you want to go to India? And you have a whole lot of social media activism against Indians in Europe, in, the, in, in North America, in Africa, and you know, actively by, spread by 
the, the Sino-Wahhabi lobby and the Sino-Russian lobby's tentacles. Because outside India, the Russians are very active. In India, as of now, it's not possible to discover any Russian activity in Malayan activity. But outside India, especially in the United States, the Sino-Russian and Sino-Wahhabi lobby are very, very active. So G20, if you don't get an agreed statement, it's not the end of the world. We will retain our strategic focus. The point is, we need that full-blooded commitment of the United States to the defense of the Indo-Pacific. The commitment that we have demonstrated in the blood of our valiant soldiers. We want that full-blooded commitment, not in terms of human blood, but in terms of the, uh, of the facilities, the requisites that are needed for democracies to prevail. And may I point out, Australia, I mean, you know, Daniel Suidani, for example, he, if, if you were to ask for, you know, you have amazing work that you have done. You began the whole thing. Uh, I, I am very happy to say that Heritage, Jeff Smith, you know, he went into it. And that is a great thing. And others also did. Uh, brilliant. But the fact is, this government, the Labour government, is, I mean, they're in this, you know, two, two country situation. The fact is, on technology, you have to decouple. On other things, you need not for the time being. But eventually, you will have to decouple. It's like two walls, and you're sitting with one leg on one side, one leg on the other. The walls are now separating from each other. If you, you have to accept the reality of Cold War 2.0. My book has just come out a few days ago, Manipal University's Press, which is 21st century geopolitics of 21st century. My next book is coming out in August, which is Penguin Random House on Cold War 2.0. It is Cold War 2.0, and we have taken a side. We are not that done it you know, as openly as, for example, some other political. I'm very happy to see President Moon has taken, I mean, President the, the, the Suk of South Korea has taken a very clear stand. He's with the United States. Japan has always taken that stand. We have taken that stand by joining the Quad. We were, I was, some of us were surprised that we were not in AUKUS, but we joined the Quad. What does that mean? What does that particularly mean? You know, if, I mean, if I come to your house for dinner, does it mean that I think of you as an enemy or I think likely of you? No, it means we are, we are together. So we have taken our side. Joe Biden has taken his side, but Joe Biden has to understand half measures are like half truths. They do more harm than good. And may I point out in the 1930s, there was a situation in which the real monster was not taken seriously. Again, Russia was seen as the monster. And that monster grew and grew and grew in plain sight. Adolf Hitler was as transparent as yeah, Xi Jinping in many ways. He grew in plain sight until it was too late to prevent a war. If you want to prevent a war, if Joe Biden wants to prevent a war, he has to show the United States is not just a partner, not just a reliable partner, but a substantive partner who is willing to go all the way to make a difference in a war that is going to define the contours of the 21st century. Your children and grandchildren are going to be the victims or the winners in that particular war that is going to take place, that is taking place. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Nalabad. We'll leave some links below to uh, your books that are just coming out, including some of your articles. Uh, it's very fascinating, and it's, it's always great to you know, get a perspective outside of what we might hear in the U.S. from Western media to just see what else is going on in the world and how other countries are dealing with the threat of the Chinese Communist Party. I would just like to say, God bless the United States of America. God bless India. And may I point out that this alliance is critical for the future of the democratic world. The two biggest democracies must be allies complete and total allies in the war that is upon us, the Cold War 2.0. And I am very firmly of the view that I have trust in the American people. Look what happened to Daniel Sudani. The State Department refused him his visa. And you guys put pressure. And he got a visa. And then the U.S. Congress people stepped in magnificently. And he was given some of the honor that he deserves. Nothing and nobody in the administration, of course, but at, at least in the U.S. Congress. Why? Because that's how democracy works. They've got checks and balances. There's no such thing in China. In China, there's just one 
There's, let, again, let me end by saying the Chinese people are not the Chinese Communist Party members for 98 million. The Chinese Communist Party members are not the senior members of the Chinese Communist Party, totally different from them. The senior members of the Chinese Communist Party are not the top members of the Chinese Communist Party. They are again a universe different from them. And some of us have had the good fortune to go through all the different layers. And frankly, because we are from India, you know, we are not seen as a Western power, as a technologically whatever it is. They are a little more, little less guarded, let's say, uh, in their messaging uh, when talking to us. And secondly, as I, you know, I never take the big Chinese uh, media seriously, the big communist media. I take small little provincial papers. I read them because that reflects the truth. And every single provincial paper is talking about the imminent takeover of Taiwan by General Secretary Xi Jinping. They're all talking about it. The Taiwanese are reading that. We are reading that. You guys should be reading that. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us. And thank you for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll see you next time.